Hello and welcome to the Daily Racing Forum webinar on the new DRF Tournaments website and our DRF Tournament Strategy Session. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, back with you alongside the stalwart performer in these webinars, and that's Mike Hogan. Mike, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great, Pete. How are you doing? I'm extremely good because I've been waiting, as many of us at DRF have, um, to get this new platform launched. I think it's just a fantastic development that's going to be beneficial to all horse players, especially the ones who are already contest players. And I'm excited to go through, take the next hour or so, show people what the new DRF tournament site is, how they can find it at tournaments.drf.com. We're going to give an overview about how to use the site. We're going to show you some basics, creating an account, uh, creating an account and logging in, buying credits, how to enter your picks, and we're going to make picks and view the leaderboard. Then we'll get on to strategy, and we'll also do some question and answers. Mike, why don't you tell folks how they can ask us questions at any time during the webinar? Sure. So through the webinar chat panel uh, in the right-hand portion of your screen, you'll be able to submit questions. They'll get passed through to us. Uh, I will jump in uh, probably a little later in the this, in this session, especially when we get into the strategy part, and I'll be peppering a lot of these questions to Pete, uh, but if you have any questions, send them along, and if they're general ones, um, we'll get to them at the end uh, in our question and answer session. Absolutely, uh, I, I want to point out. Uh, I want to point out. We we welcome as much uh, as much feedback as everybody in the audience wants to give. There's a lot of information to cover here, and if you miss anything we say or we go over something too quickly, feel free to ask about it. And if you want to go back and re-watch the webinar, you can do that. It's going to be archived at drf.com slash YouTube. So you can go and re-watch if there's anything you missed. And uh, how shall we start off today, Mike? Uh, yeah, well, let's, let's first mention how people get there. It's tournaments.drf.com. Uh, no www needed. So tournaments.drf.com will take you straight to the page. Let's switch over there right now. Uh, I've got the screen open. Um, this is how it looks. We're not logged in, so this is what you see prior to login. Um, and if you scroll through, you'll see all the contests scheduled um, today and in the upcoming days. So you'll see the ones for this weekend. Um, the, uh, um, actually, a few qualifiers um, for uh, NHCQ, BCQ, and uh, DRF qualify for Monmouth Park and Santa Anita. Um, so you can sign up for any of these at any given time. Um, as you can see, there's an entry or reserve your entry um, to, to get in. You can also get into the NH NHC qualifiers or, or uh, the DRF qualifiers for Santa Anita. The credits here are what you will need in order to enter, enter any of these contests. We should point out that the, the content on the existing sites, DRF Qualify, BC Qualify, NHC Qualify, that's now all going to live here at tournaments.drf.com. There is one exception. I don't want to confuse people, but there is a round two BC Qualify contest still happening on the old site this weekend. But uh, after that and everything except for that, it's all going to be happening here. Those qualifiers, Mike, if you scroll down, you can, we can show folks what they look like now. If you get to Saturday, there's one. Um, you see that they were showing right there the DRFQ for Monmouth Park and the DRFQ for Santa Anita. But what's really great about this site is that now, in addition to that contest content, which you've been used to us offering, instead of having to pay in for the full buy-in, you have an opportunity during the week and on the weekends to win your buy-ins to the qualifier through feeder contests. And this is where it gets really fun, because all of a sudden, you have a chance to play in this NHCQ feeder, for example, for $18, and you win your seat to the qualifier. You win in the qualifier, all of a sudden, you have a chance at the NHC to win your share of $2.5 million, all from an $18 starting price. As somebody who writes about contests for a living, this is what gets me really excited because I feel like we're sort of set up to have our 
Chris Moneymaker a moment in horse racing where we get somebody to win in for small money, go knock heads with the, the, the big time players whose names we're all learning, and come away with the big bucks. So it's, uh, that's one of the most exciting things about the new tournaments platform. Mike, why don't we show folks how they can sign up? Absolutely. So uh, in the right-hand portion of the screen uh, near the top, uh, there's the login. You can also log in right here. That's if you have an existing DRF tournaments login. If you don't, you're going to need to register here by clicking this button. That takes you to this page. Um, even if you've registered previously at NHC Qualify, BC Qualify, DRF Qualify, you still need to update your account in order to play on this tournament pro platform. It's a very important note. And, and the way you do that is you sign in using your existing DRF account right here. Uh, if you don't have a DRF account, if you've never bought anything, you've never played a contest with uh, DRF before, you click this button and you fill in some basic information including uh, birth date and, and last four of Social Security. That's needed for an age and identity verification. Well, Mike, you're not going to show us your Social Security number here on the <laughs> webinar? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> I think folks can get the idea, though, of the information they need to uh, they need to fill out to get to, to get rolling. And then and to, next to that blue button, we're going to show you what if you already have an account, you go to the the login button, that red little button, just to the left of that, if you're facing the screen. Exactly. Um, what I should note is at the, at the top of the register page too. There's a phone number. If you have any questions or issues, you can always call that number. That's the the help number for. Uh, uh, DRF tournaments. What I'm going to do is I'm going to log in using an, an existing DRF um, testing account. Uh, this is obviously not an account that we're going to use to play in an actual entry, but we'll we'll see all of the and, and you'll see these. This account has already uh, added an entry for the three feeders that are going off in about 14 minutes. In fact, maybe should we skip ahead and take care of that since we only have 13 minutes and 44 seconds until um, until the picks have to be in, or do you think we have time to do it all, Mike? Uh, you mean make some picks? Well, I, I don't know if we want to make picks using this existing account, Pete, because then we'll actually have picks in the leaderboard oh, right, 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 the live right. contest. We'll, we'll do one so, for tomorrow. That's smart. Exactly. So what we'll do is um, we'll, we'll enter one for tomorrow, then we'll zero it out so that it's not actually affecting the real players. We've got... Uh, you know, 94 players in this NHCQ feeder, we don't want to show up on the leaderboard and make somebody <laughs> think that we're in t running second or third because, you know, you and I, Pete, we can't play in these because we're DRF employees, but, you know, we're, we're such great handicappers, of course we'd win, right? Of course we'd win, and then there'd be a huge outcry on horse racing Twitter, and nobody wants that. But I do want to underline the fact if we were playing, it is critical to get those bets in uh, in the, the, these weekday feeder contests, they're all utilizing our all-in format. What that means is that all the picks have to be in before the first race. And I also want to emphasize that these contests do not close when the gates pop. These contests are closing at the scheduled post time. So that countdown Correct. clock, you know, you've got to take that very literally. I've ingrained that in myself to the point where I mentioned that to Mike, even though he'd already told me how we were handling this in the webinar. He was just polite <laughs> not to say, come on, man, we've been over this. Uh, I, will, I will note a couple other things. All of these feeders, these weekday feeders, they're all all-in contests. And you'll see them here with the little bug. The ones without the all-in, those are the, the ones live format, for we call them. The live format contests, and those are the, the larger buy-ins. So um, that's the other quick difference if you want to just scroll through and try and figure out one versus the other. Um, and then the other thing I'll note is if you click the description, it tells you a little bit more about the contest. It also tells you the races in the contest. And you get access, if you click the PPs, you get access to the classic PPs for all of the races being used in those particular contests. Little bit of a spoiler alert, there is some talk of introducing at some point in the next few weeks a discount code if you're a formulator user where you might be able to, uh, th through one manner or another, get access to all the races in the contest with a single formulator card buy instead of having to buy several cards worth. I think that, while it costs more than free. That's a little investment you have to make in your own play, as we'll talk about more when we get to the strategy portion of the call. 
you need to come up with a way to get an edge over your competition formulator. One of the best ways to get that edge, I hear from players all the time, including Vic Stauffer, who won the Santa Anita Preakness Challenge last weekend, how invaluable of a tool formulator is for them in their contest play. So that's just something to look forward to in the early weeks of the tournament platform launch. Exactly. And I'll, I'll just note real quick, the reason why we don't give free formulator or we don't create, people have asked, can you create a formulator card that uses these races across these multiple tracks? The, um, the problem with that is um, the, those formulator cards are generated uh, automatically as soon as the tracks send their entries into Equibase. We get a notification and the system runs on its own. The PDFs created that are posted here are cobbled together. Somebody's actually going in, saving out pages from PDFs of Classic and, mi and mixing and matching and creating a, a manual PDF, which is why we're able to do it for the Classic PPs. Yeah, it makes sense. But we, we think we have a clever workaround that can, like we said, get folks a, a good discount on that and still have a chance to uh, play their best on the new DRF tournaments platform. Absolutely. So we're looking at the DRFQ feeder for the Monmouth Park Contest. It's an $18 credit buy-in right now. Um, actually, maybe let's, let's before we do that, I'm going to click real quick and show people how to buy credits. You see um, that green button Mike just clicked on? It should have been. Yeah. It, it, it really stands out. Green for money. You start there, and yep, then you go, right here. Into, you go into this page, and the, the, uh, Mike will show you. There, it's... Uh, there's a little bit of a trick to it, but nothing that you guys yeah. can't handle. Just just one thing I'll mention. So you'll see there's $25 or $18 entry fee um, or credits needed. Those those credits are uh, converted to single dollars. So if you know you're going to be playing in, you know, two seats on this DRFQ feeder and two seats on this uh, Santa Anita feeder, okay, that's uh, $36 there, $50 there. That you, you would need 80, $86 if you wanted to play in all of them. Um, or if you click buy credits, you could say, I just want to buy one $18 or one $25. Right now, you can't do an 18 and a 25. So the solution is, OK, we know we want 86. I want to buy one 86. I'm going to do uh, credit 86 of them, update, and bam, I'm going to check out for $86. We should also point out that there's no reason, if you're somebody like me, you want to treat this more like your existing DRF bets or other ADW account, go ahead and stockpile money in there and, and just sort of leave that as your bankroll for the week or a couple of weeks or a month or however you want to do it. There's nothing preventing you from buying several hundred dollars worth of credit via this same method. It's not super intuitive. You can't just type it in on the first screen. You'll have to remember to go to that $1 or one credit screen and then type in the number there. It works just as efficiently once you get the hang of it. Absolutely. And I'm not going to go through and put in credit card information, but this is it's a standard n name and address. And then on the next screen, enter in your credit card uh, number and expir expiration date, as well as the three-digit code on the back. All right, we've only got a few minutes before the first contest starts. So if you want to buy, there's still time. Um, We've got seven minutes. Let's actually go through. Let's add. I'm not going to save because this is an important note. Once we make our picks, you actually have to click the Save Picks button in order for them to be submitted. Think of this as a like a Submit Picks. We can go through and see. And for the first one, we can see the live odds and the tote. The morning line on Animal Quiet is 8 to 5. Well, in the live odds, is getting bet more heavily down to 3 to 5. So you can see that on the all-in Obviously, you can only see it on the two open races, which would be Gulfstream 5 and Belmont 5. Uh, for the live, or not live money, what was it you call it, Pete? Just live format. The live format, you'll see these odds, live odds changing throughout in, in the contest, which is, which is nice. You don't need your ADW open to get the live odds. Uh, they update as they go. So let's, uh, let's make a few picks. We won't save them because saving them would, would make this a live entry. But let's say in, uh, who, do you, who do you want to pick in Gulfstream 5 there, Pete? Let's look at some connections. I didn't, uh, I didn't handicap uh, I Me didn't neither. Handicap the race. Let's go, well, for the, let's go for the Kabisky runner at 6-1. to one. Yeah, I was going to say, I've got to go for some draft beer as well. Um, <laughs> Hunchback. 
The hunch bet, exactly. Uh, and then in Belmont, uh, race five, again, the toad is open, so we can see um, Chad Brown, no, no surprise, on the turf, is favored at six to five. We've got seven to two. Let's take the nine to two third choice, the Linda Rice runner. I think that sounds good. Uh, and you'll see you go through here, um, and you can we can select out, uh, what do you think, leg three, Pete, Gulfstream, race six, uh, anything jumping out at you? I'm I'm feeling storm sense the five. I did not handle the race. All right, chalk player, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess you know these all-in contests, <laughs> as we'll talk about when we get to strategy. It does open up the game to use favorites a little bit more. But we'll put a pin in that and come back to it. Uh, exactly. When we're talking strategy in the second half of the webinar. And we want to keep our eye on this clock because, as Pete mentioned, it does when this goes to zero, it closes regardless of whether or not. Uh, there's still it's Gulfstream, so they may be three or four or five minutes before the gates open. It's it locks when this clock hits zero. So keep that in mind when you're making your picks. You might want to save as you go. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to make this a live entry. But you could save as you go. That takes care of things. One thing that people will do if you're worried, if you're if you're in a tight time frame situation, I do this all the time if playing in a live format contest. But you could do it in this one as well. And that's go ahead at first and make default picks just in case something happens, you get distracted. At least you'll have something in there. We actually yes. saw an instance earlier this year where somebody had just played all the number ones in a contest and actually somewhat embarrassingly ended up <laughs> winning his way into the NAC. That's not why we're doing this. We're doing it just in case you get cut off, you end up only putting in three quarters of your picks. At least you have something in there and you're not drawing completely dead late on in the contest. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and finish this out. Um, also, I'll note at any time we could make a new entry and that would allow us to make a second entry here. Um, yeah, let's buy a new entry. Cool thing. Um, yeah, let's uh, and see we get this note. All selections must be made within five minutes because we're we're within five minutes. So we've we're, we've now got a second entry. We could go through, do the same thing. We want draft beer. We want, and you'll see here the way you toggle between your two entries is first entry or second entry. We should point out uh, somebody clever out there is probably thinking, well, why can't you just automatically copy uh, picks from one entry to another and then use that as a starting point and alter them from there? Well or do that across contests even. That is one of the features we're working on and will hopefully be out in, uh, in short order. Another thing somebody might say is, oh, well, especially for an all-in contest, wouldn't it be a useful thing to have alternate picks in there? And the answer is absolutely it would. And that's another thing we're going to be working on. Uh, someone more cynical still might say, well, why didn't you guys put all this stuff in there before you debuted? And the answer to that is quite simply, we wanted players to have the opportunity as quickly as possible to get going to play in these major tournaments for small buy-ins. The trend more and more in the contest world at, at the on-track tournaments is towards these live bankroll events that might even be out of the out of the bankroll comfort of a lot of players out there. But by debuting these feeder contests, these low buy-in feeder contests, I figure it's a little, uh, my, the way I look at it is it's a, it's a little chance to uh, keep that littler bankroll player in the game and give them something exciting to, uh, to aspire to in the contest world. And uh, so, so we just wanted to get, the, get this up and running as quickly as possible. We welcome feedback, and we will be making improvements as we go along. That's absolutely right, Pete, because there are, we know that there are a lot of things that we're already planning on doing and that will be rolled out into the site very soon. And you mentioned alternate picks, especially in the all-in contest. Those are coming, so we know that. Um, we just did not want to delay the launch of this to allow people to uh, very economically and very cheaply be able to enter into these feeder contests and, and parlay maybe $18 into a really uh, potentially life-changing score. Absolutely, especially uh, we at, we're running these the feeders and qualifiers now for the Santa Anita Gold Cup contest. News just announced last week that any player who wins one of the remaining Santa Anita contests this year and goes on to win the Breeders' Cup betting challenge gets a million-dollar bonus. So in addition to the several hundred thousand you're going to get already for winning the Breeders' Cup betting challenge, a chance to walk with a, a cool mill. Not too bad and a life-changing mm -hmm. score for just about anybody. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're already getting a few questions. Let's tackle some of them as the as the clock clicks down. We're within the last minute. Um, someone wants to know if you scratch, do you get the the favorite? Right now, yes, you do. Yeah. Um, eventually, those alternate picks will go in, but certainly, I think the fairest thing to do, the sort of established model of how to handle that situation, is to get to the post time favorite. Uh, some contest play. I get it. Some contest players aren't going to like that because. A lot of contest players, or like a lot of horse players, are dyed in the wool contrarians, and the last thing they want is a favorite. But let me tell you, there's going to be some time where that puts you on a horse that you wouldn't have had that ends up helping you late in, in a contest. So it cuts both ways. The alternate picks are the better way to go, and that will be happening eventually. But everybody's playing by the same rules here, and we thought this was the fairest way to do it under the circumstances. Yeah, and you know the nice thing with these feeders too is, um, let's say you're working, you're not able to, maybe you're listening to this webinar on archive, and you want to go put in your picks in the morning, then you're going to go to work. You're not even going to be able to to, to take a look at the, the early scratches, let alone um, you know who's the favorite or how the odds are playing out. Uh, you can put your picks in, and you're not necessarily at a disadvantage against the other players, whereas you might be uh, in the live format. That's a great point, and another thing that's that's great about running these weekday feeders in the all-in format, it gives you an opportunity to, to to have a little bit more of a life. You know, you can spend mm -hmm. your time handicapping in the morning. You can put in your picks. You can go about your day. I mean, believe it or not, there are some people who even treat some of the live formats on on the weekend that way. Um, you can also play on mobile, but for some reason, some people will will put in picks and and go about their business. And it's definitely, as Mike points out, a competitive disadvantage. This certainly levels the playing field as far as that goes, and is something that just fits nicely within your real life. I wouldn't be surprised if someday, eventually, maybe down the line, we offer a mix of feeders, some of the live format for the nuts like me who sit in our offices in the afternoon and watch racing all day, and some for the people who actually have lives. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, as you can see, the entry is now closed. We can't save or change our picks. Um, so uh, now... Uh, we can get to some of the questions soon. Once the um, first race goes official, the leaderboard will stop start populating. But what you can see is, as soon as it's closed, you can see every one of the in, all in format. You can see the picks of everybody in the contest. Um, we're working on uh, potentially at some point. See, here's here's me, no pick. Uh, so uh, obviously, we're not going to win this one. Um, but you can go through and you can see who all you're playing against. And uh, at some point, we might change the way this, this is served up, um, either a grid or see how many horses are picked in, in which particular races. But it's, it's kind of nice. That's the other thing you can do is once the leaderboard starts, starts populating, you can see who you're playing against and, and who, they've, who they've selected. I went ahead on my RTN account and popped up the Gulfstream Park feed. In fact, the horses are milling about behind the gate, but we should have that one going soon. Why don't we do a question or two in the meantime, Mike? All right, let's, uh, let's do it. So um, we, we had a few. Somebody wanted to know if there are any one-track contests planned. That is good feedback. As of yet, the minimum we've done is two-track. But what I suggest that you do is send an email to tourneyhelp at drf.com. Make, just make that as a suggestion if it's something that you're interested in. I'll note it as well. You don't need to buy I, I was going to say you could tweet me, but I already got that feedback. It's something that I'll bring up when I sit in on meetings about uh, how we're looking to develop the tournament site. There, there, there's something that I could see being charming about that in terms of, okay, it's the Santa Anita uh, feeder for a Santa Anita qualifier. Wouldn't it be fun to play all Santa Anita? I think part of it is has to do with the, the time frame that we want the contest to be. Um, it's a little bit tighter of a band, so I don't know that that's going to happen for sure. But it's interesting feedback, and I'm, if, you know, if enough people request it, I, it's something that I could see moving up the the ladder of discussions at DRF internally. Yeah, I see our buddy Jonathan Kinchin has has an entry in here. Uh, looks like he didn't quite get to fill out his, so maybe he'll <laughs> he'll hit with the first of four. all people. I of know. all people, we were just doing the podcast this morning, and I made that same point. And uh, and he gets skunked. Oh well. Yep. What are you Can't win do? them all, Jonathan. 
maybe he'll take down. Maybe he'll hit a cold early pick four and, and have enough to hold on uh, to qualify. Uh, but let's get to a few other questions uh, while we're waiting for the leaderboard to start populating. Um, Steve Cortez wants to know, do you need a uh, membership to the NHC Tour to play on this site? No, you do not. You would need the membership to play in the direct NHC qualifier that's happening this weekend. However, you can play in the feeder without the paying the $50, and then you can pony up the 50 before the qualifier happens. Now, my personal opinion, you might as well just get it out of the way. Go ahead and pay the 50, join the NHC tour, take care of it for the year, because that will enable you to play for NHC seats, not just on our site, but in any tournament where those are offered, and also, NHC tour members get discounts on DRF past performance products, so essentially you can make the NHC tour membership pay for itself. Yeah, and you can also play for free at uh, Public Handicapper, where you can uh, earn a seat Great directly point. into the NH NH NHC from there. Uh, we've had in the past people that didn't pay the fifty dollars and would have gotten a seat had they done so. So you don't want to. I hate to say it, it's almost a regular occurrence on Public Handicapper that somebody costs themselves an NHC seat for not putting that together. The big Public Handicapper contest started just a couple of weeks ago. You're you still, I would say, have every chance. To, to catch up and get in there because Public Handicapper is a different kind of contest. That's still living under its own umbrella, publichandicapper.com, where you, 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 the picks you have that our winners get added to your bankroll, losing picks are deducted $2. So you could enter that contest today with zero and, and be uh, ahead of a, a whole lot of the field. It's worth checking out for that free roll and a great way, I think, for new players to supplement their contest play between playing at the DRF tournament site, tournaments.drf.com, and also learning on Public Handicapper, getting a chance to read and write their own race analyses. And there's also weekly and monthly prizes so folks can, uh, can free roll for some pretty cool stuff. Uh, all right, well, let's get to a few more questions. People want to know about the prize pool per contest, and I'm assuming that the feeder contest. Uh, it's not necessarily that you win cash or a prize, but you win an entry to uh, the, the NHC qualifier or the qualifier contest on the weekend for these other ones. But Pete, what percentage we've currently got in this one that we're looking at for Monmouth Park feeder, we've got 50 players in there. Of those 50, how many can expect to earn a seat through to the Saturday? It's qualifier. five players. It's the top 10 per So far, all the contests I've seen on the tournament site, all the feeders, it's the top 10%. They've been priced in a way where the top 10% are advancing to the qualifiers on the weekend. I'm not sure if that ratio is going to be tweaked. You can always find that in the description of the contest where Mike is, uh, where Mike is looking. You can even show them if you want. If you want to play John Madden and use the Telestrator and uh, <laughs> oh, circle yeah. the top 10%, you can, you, can see, uh, you can see exactly what that is for each contest. The most common one so far is the top 10% as listed there in the front. It kind of grays it out. We need something. We need yeah, something a little more exciting yeah. than that. But, but right. folks can well. see where, where we're pointing at and, and have a chance to check if those ratios change. But I think that's a favorable ratio for players to finish in the top 10%. It, it's a good, especially for a newer player. It's very hard. It's been done, but it's very hard for a newer player to come in and finish in the top 2% of a contest and, uh, and get the prize. But to be able to sort of build to it slowly, top 10%, that's not having a miracle day. That's having a good day. That's picking a few winners. But I think it, for newer players especially, it gives them a chance to, to hit the ground running a little bit more than diving in the deeper water of the qualifier straight away. All right, a couple more questions. Um, Rob, Robert Carlson wants to know, does the mobile version have all the same options? Um, I believe the mobile, this DRF uh, tournament's um, tournaments.drf.com is mobile optimized. So you can it use is. this on a mobile device and it'll, it should work exactly the same way. Again, if there are any problems with that, you can uh, let me know on Twitter, at Looms Boldly. Feel free to call the number Mike pointed out before or send an email to at tourneys, or to, excuse me, at tourneyhelp.drf.com. We are very much invested in helping everybody have the best customer experience they can have. And uh, you know, with any new endeavor, there, there might be some questions and some, some growing pains along the way. But we, we want to hear from you, and we want to help you get the best experience you can out of the new tournament platform. All right. Well, it looks like uh, race 
five at Gulfstream Park is over. I don't know if it's official yet. Um, I don't know if we have the leaderboard updated quite yet. Um, yeah. It looks like we do. Uh, had we saved our pick, it sounds like we would be one of the top ones because <laughs> draft beer won. You know, you always you can't go wrong with draft beer, right? That's, that's what I always say, Mike. You see some familiar <laughs> names up there. Mike McIntyre, a force on the tournament scene. George Shute's name we see all the time. Uh, Jim Sebus has been having a, a big run of late. But I'm also happy to say I see some names of folks that I don't see on leaderboards all the time who I'm presuming are newer players. It's good to see a lot of people getting involved, whether their name is high up on the NHC Tour leaderboard like Joe Pettit down there in 16th or, or some of these other folks who aren't as familiar to us. I think this hopefully is going to provide a gateway to a lot more people getting involved in contests. And I hope some of you have never played in the tournament, are in this webinar, watching along with us, and we can get you pumped up enough about this that you can do really well. And I'll be writing about you next week in the pages of Daily Racing Forum and on DRF.com. Uh, that see that's that's what's really exciting to me about it is you get the opportunity to play with some of the best players and you can be a no name you know unknown that that uh, bursts on the scene wins wins away your way into one of the the Saturday ones wins your way into the NHC and, and all of a sudden you're in the pages of the Daily Racing Forum um, pretty cool stuff people get a kick out of it too I've had people. Uh particularly with the miracle year our friend uh, Jonathan Kinchin, our our co-host on the podcast, had last year. I've had people tell me one of my best thrills in racing was beating that guy in the last leg of the contest (laughs) on NHC Qualify. And and even just the brief thrill here of seeing chalk eater that he is, he he goes with the favorite there, and so he has has 20. But, uh, you know, it's kind of fun to see your name on the leaderboard ahead uh, ahead of somebody like that or Joe Pettit, a guy who's kind of like uh, one of the candidates to be this year's Kinch and just winning everything in sight in the tournament world. Yeah, and it's nice, too, because if let's say you're one of the uh, 11 people, or I guess 10 people because George Shute has uh, two entries in the top 10. Um, you're, you're one of these. You want to see who all you're playing against. You want to ho- see who you root, you, you're rooting against or rooting for in, in the Belmont Race 5, you can go through and you can look at who all of these players have picked, um, which is kind of nice. You can you can get a sense. Uh, look, Mike McIntyre uh, maybe in, in unintentionally skipped the race. Um, you know, you, you can you can see that right away. Yeah, you get a sense, especially as you get down to the wire. You'll have a chance to sort of know going into it. Okay, well, I'm in front going to the last race. This is the horse that I picked earlier. And now I'll have an opportunity to know who, which other horses, essentially, I have covered. In other words, who can win and I still win. You go, you go down far enough and you see what everybody else picked and you can know what level you're, you're, you're safe up to and which horses can hurt you. Just, I think, adds to the excitement a little bit rather than having to wait until the race goes off and, and only then be able to check. Yeah, um, and, and uh, Ray Arsenault wants to know if you can see the leaderboard if you're not playing in the contest. Right now you can't, but that's one of the things that we've talked about adding uh, when we talked about making these updates, like adding alternates and uh, some of these other things. That's one of them, is, is even if you didn't enter the contest uh, in the future, you'll, you'll have the ability to see the leaderboard. One thing that I will say, Ray, I don't remember, Ray, if you're on Twitter, you should be if you're not, following Tommy Massis, it's worth it just for that. But if you, I'm going to be uh, helping out as part of a team of folks operating the DRF Tournament's Twitter handle. And I think as, uh, as some of these days go on, I'll be providing some live look-ins via screenshots to let folks know what's going on, especially in the qualifiers more than the feeders. I'll probably do that. But maybe we'll take a few looks in at the feeders as well as we see some interesting developments. That's a really good question, Ray. Thanks for piping in. Here's a very specific question. You may know the answer. If not, I can, I can navigate back to the main screen. Um, what is the max entries for the um, May 28th Monmouth qualifier? Do you know, Pete? The feeders, you can do three. I. I think, I can't remember if it's two or three for that one. Why don't we go check? We'll show people how they can look this up themselves. Well, he may have been asking not just the um, individual 
what they can enter. Oh, and see, when we hit home, it defaults to My Tournaments. It shows you there's a toggle between My Tournaments and Upcoming Tournaments. Once you're entered in, in, in an active tournament, it will default to this. If you want to pick an upcoming one, you click on this button, and then you can scroll down and, and see all the others. Um, the, they're, uh, they're no limit. So you, you can do two entries as an individual, but there is no limit to uh, how many total can enter. Again, oh, I misunderstood the question. OK, yeah. yeah. The, the, it's all, what we're doing is we're going basically by ratio in all these contests. Right. In other words, uh, one in, if it, if in a contest like a qualifier, oh, we should see what it is. Um, right, one in 70. Yes, for, one for in this 70. One. And then three entries we'll, per person, and we'll pay breakage. If we don't get to the full seventy, we pay out on that breakage. But uh, the thought is, it's a new platform. We know there's a lot of people excited about it. Some weeks we've been very, uh, very pleasantly surprised by the number of folks we have. We don't want to limit it. We figure as long as that ratio stays the same, everybody's winning. Um, and the bigger field just means more seats get given away. So uh, that's, that's how we're doing that. I thought you meant entries per tournament, because I know the feeders tournament, one can have three. Right. And, and right. for that Monmouth contest, is it limited to two, or is it three for, for how many entries an individual can have? Well, this one, th this NHC qualifier is three. Each of the descriptions should say, for the Monmouth one, uh, it looks like it is um, to, to do, oh, so it's one per 18 entries. Um, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, it doesn't oh, yeah. say how many, yeah, it doesn't say it's a, a no it's limit. Two or, it's either two or yeah. three, trial and error yeah. it and figure it out, <laughs> and I have a feeling that'll be being added to the copy as we go. Yeah, and, and you can see the races already, and you can actually get those PPs right now. Uh, if you if you're interested in playing or if you want to decide you can take a quick look maybe you decide it's a really tough race and, and I want to pay a little extra and get the formulator for the day because it as Pete said it will give you an edge you'll have information that a lot of the other players you're playing against won't have that question about how many entries to play as an individual is really interesting some players use multiple entries as a critical part of their strategy but a lot of players I'd say the majority of players that I know seem to depend how many entries they're going to take on their specific opinions of a card. And we'll talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about this when we get to mm -hmm. strategy, possibly. But the general idea being, if there are a few wide open races where you think a really big priced horse can win, that's going to be a, a race where you're going to want to maybe take more entries and cover a few more of those bombs. And then you can rely on your strongest opinions in the in maybe play, even if you're playing three entries, several races especially in the all-in format, you're likely to have, uh, you're likely to play the same horse on all of them. Right, right. Um, and that was actually a, a question Daniel McKeon had. He wanted to know, uh, particularly if you, if you had two entries, would you want to do one with all A's and the other all B's and C's? Or, you know, and again, I, I think it goes back to how you feel about the sequence and how, you know, uh, maximizing your strongest opinions and maybe backing up in places where you feel like it's a, it's a little more wide open. The all-in format definitely provides a wrinkle to that. I would say the, the, the sort of most... There's two kind of established multi-ticket strategies in live play. And I'll talk about those first because that might inform what we're talking about when we get to the all-in. Uh, there's sort of the good ticket, bad ticket theory that I know Paul Sherman espouses and has done super well with, where you have sort of your, 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 your top pick and a secondary pick. And once either, let's say the secondary pick, say you hit something with that first, then that becomes the good ticket, and your sort of A horse goes on there, and then the other ticket is used for the back up. And you'll sometimes have some frustration in that situation where you keep, it's called splitting tickets. You keep getting horses on one ticket and the other, and you end up, let's say 100 would be a winning total, you end up with 50 and 50. It can be very frustrating. But of course, what I always encourage people to remember when they complain about split tickets is, well, your, your best ticket your best opinion was on the ticket that you were the most focused on. It's just one of those things. It's not like if you played one ticket, that means you would have had it necessarily. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. one thing that people do. The other thing, uh, Jonathan Kinchin mastered this at the NHC a couple of years ago, that idea of playing a lot the same and then just in races where you have two opinions 
reaching for two different horses. But by and large, I think at that NHC, he played 65%, maybe 75% of the picks exactly the same. Now, in an all-in format, it's different because you can't do those kind of adjustments on the fly that you can do in the live format. For me, that would just be a case of looking at the specific races and just knowing there were a couple of options where I, wa I knew I wanted to be able to reach for a price and have two, or in some cases, three chances at that price. I'd come up with a backbone of a ticket of these are the four or the five, maybe, the uh, horses that I'm going to use to anchor all my tickets. And then in races where either I thought long shots were going to come in, or I just had less of an opinion, or I just didn't like the favorite, spread around in there. So I think for mm -hmm. that's probably the best advice I can give for the for ticket multiple ticket strategy in the all in events. Yeah, and you know it's funny we've mentioned Jonathan Kinchin a few times. He's not on today. His, his ears are probably ringing from how much we've we've mentioned his name. One of the questions we just got is. Um, is asking about why we might be suggesting that novice players who can only maybe get one entry would think that they had a chance to beat someone like Kinchin who might be playing with three entries. Um, the easy answer there is on any given day, your opinion can beat any of the top players, and we've seen it happen. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the luck to skill ratio in horse racing is something that's worth examining. I mean, nobody sits back when they're making a bet in the paramutual pools and worries about who the smartest money is in the pool and, and what they're able to do to the prices in the market and, and, and how that affects their, their chances. I will tell you guaranteed, you're a lot better going up against the top tournament players in a tournament environment uh, th than I think in any other situation gambling-wise in, ho in horse playing. I mean, we see somebody like Paul Sherman He's still losing a lot more tournaments than he's winning. These guys mm -hmm. haven't. They have an edge, and they're great players, but they're not magicians. On any given day, with your handicapping opinion, you can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and beat them. And I would argue that in equity terms, if you learn a little bit about contest strategy and if your handicapping is solid, you'll, you'll have a chance to make a, a terrific return on investment with way less of a learning curve than you will on your ADW account. Absolutely, absolutely. And speaking of ADW accounts, Noel Michaels wants to know if this is linked to your DRF bets account for withdrawals and deposits. And the short answer is no. They're completely separate wallets. And in fact, any of the DRF bets regulations, like you have to be uh, residing in certain states and things like that, and even certain tracks are available via DRF bets that and they're not depending upon where you live, those sorts of restrictions do not apply to the DRF tournament site. It's fantastic to hear, hear from Noel. He's uh, one of the guys who's been in the tournament scene a long time. There'd be no me without the groundbreaking work that Noel did years ago on his handicapping contest handbook. And there's plenty of information in that book that's still relevant. Noel's quoted extensively in my book, The Winning Contest Player, and it's uh, great to have him on the webinar today. All right, well, they're off in the fifth race at Belmont, which is the second race in this contest. So soon we should know how the leaderboard is going to switch um, uh, on our feeder contest. While we're waiting for that result, um, why don't you talk a little bit about the difference between the DRF tournament site and maybe some of the competitors' sites? Sure. I mean, I think everybody has a lot of the same goals. Um, the biggest difference, I think, our site, everything is being done with an industry partner. So we're contributing money to handle via putting players into these live bankroll contests like Monmouth and Belmont and Santa Anita. And then we also have industry partners like the NHC, of course, major marketing initiative for the industry, and of course the Breeders' Cup betting challenge, which the money goes back into live bankroll. So that's, that's one area where I think we're, we're a little bit different. We're very much plugged into working with, with industry partners and making, stuff, and making stuff happen along those lines. Really, in terms of the technology, I think it should be, things should be pretty familiar if you've played online, whether it was on the existing NHCQ, BCQ, DRFQ platforms are at one of the competitors. Hopefully folks will find themselves at home right away on the DRF tournaments platform. 
All right. Well, the seven horse at Belmont has just won race five. That is the seven to five favorite, Tizel. Uh, we can quickly jump to the leaderboard and see how that is going to affect things. It's not going to be enough to get any of the um, uh, ones that had the second place finisher at Gulfstream into the lead, but we can see who among the, the leaders had Tizel and will Let's become our new chalk players. Let's find the chalk players, yes. Uh, so far, not too many. Um, uh, we might not have even had, this is a small enough contest where we might not have anyone on this favorite, uh, which is interesting because then we'll pay out to um, the, the horse who ran second, which I believe was the one horse. Yes, Alabama bound uh, the one. Uh, there we go, uh, George uh, Shute. So George, George Shute. On one of his did he play the same horse on both entries this time? That's just sort of interesting to see strategically. He did not. He did not. Yeah, so That's something that folks also, especially if you're somebody like the person who asked about knocking heads with the big players, a great thing about the tournament platform is you can go and see somebody whose name you see on leaderboards all the time, whether it's George Shute or, uh, or Joe Pettit or Jim Sebus or any of the other, or Mike McIntyre, any of the other big names who are up there. You can go and see who they played and learn a lot. It's it's sort of like getting a lesson at the foot of the master sometimes, and see that see that the question I asked about George Shute, you know, does he play the same horse every entry, or does he or does he move things around? You you can't help but learn something when you're looking at these successful players and how they go about their craft. It's just another way I believe you can uh, decrease your learning curve when you're when you're playing in tournaments. And so far, it hasn't come into play in this contest uh, with a 1380 winner in the first leg and a seven, a six to five shot in the second leg. Um, but uh, one of our uh, viewers wants to know if there's a cap on the prices paid. That's a terrific question, and the answer is yes. It'll be the familiar cap to you from our other contest sites: 20 to one on the win end, 10 to one on the place end. So you could have a hundred dollar horse. Uh, you're only going to get 64 combined win and place. I think over time it's been proved that especially in short field contests, the cap is just critical. It's not, it's not a fun experience to be able to get beaten by one horse. Yes, it can still happen with a salary cap and it makes people's face look like they just uh, sucked on a lemon, but it, it's, it's a, the cap is a terrific real world solution to keeping folks just reaching at prices while it still exists. It doesn't get completely out of control. Of course, that's one of the reasons people love the all-in format is that you can't play a horse just based on its price. I object when people say it's a pure test of handicapping the all-in format because to me, handicapping requires having meaningful and actual odds. But what it is, the all-in format, is the purest picking contest there is. Hey, Andy Byer's landmark book was called Picking Winners. I think folks who spent much time betting money at the racetrack these days understand that in 2016, picking winners alone isn't going to get you very far. There's a lot of other components to it. But in the all-in format, that player, yeah, there's some strategy, but it's really all about picking winners, and that's mm -hmm. something that a lot of players want and have an opportunity to do and get paid for a lot more than they do just betting in the paramutual pools. All right, Adam Dodge just asked, can you take more within one entry into the qualifier uh, if George Shute uh, finishes first and second, does he get two spots? I do believe the answer to that question is yes. To be honest, I'm not 100% sure, um, but I, I'm pretty certain there are some contests where that's limited. I know with like the two-round Breeders' Cup betting challenge qualifier, you, you can't win more than one NHC seat or more than one BCBC seat out of a qualifier, but I'm guessing that since all you're doing is winning an an entry into the qualifier out of a feeder, that that would be kosher, but uh, that's something I will look into, and if I'm incorrect in that information, I will be posting about it on Twitter shortly, so you can go there for my follow-up answer to at Looms Boldly on Twitter. All right, perfect. We have a real general question here. We talked a lot about tournament strategy. Uh, let's just talk about general handicapping strategy. Um, Daniel McKeon wants to know, what are some of the best angles that you might want to look for? Uh, and I'll, I'll extrapolate and say what well, you might want to look for in trying to find a horse in a contest like this that might provide value. Yeah, there's so many. It's a great thing for angle players because 
The fact of the matter is, I believe, again, at the paramutual windows, it's tough to get by day in, day out without having like a really strong grasp on the fundamentals and maybe leaning on an angle occasionally. But when it comes to the type of horses that can really make a difference in tournaments, I, I think you know it's almost like any reason to bet a cap horse. And angles mm -hmm. can point you to a lot of those. Now, for me, it's not how I approach the game all that often, but I will say that DRF Plus offers some really cool tools that can help you uh, uncover more angle-type plays. We did a whole webinar a few months ago on DRF Plus with an eye, in a lot of instances, towards how it can help contest players. Mike, what do you remember as some of the key tools in there to, that, that might help put people on long shots? Yeah, so in the DRF Plus, you have a, uh, access to a number of different reports, things like the positive ROI report, the key race report, where you can pull up uh, a PDF for, for all of the horses running on a specific day, today or tomorrow or uh, maybe even two days from now, and it will show you all the ones that are coming out of key races, which has had more than two next out winners, any of them that have where trainers have positive ROIs in certain situations, maybe with first-time starters or maybe in uh, sprints or things like that. And so you can use those when you see there's a certain trainer, he's got a positive ROI uh, in sprints on dirt and off of long layoffs. And all three of those are happening with that particular horse. Then obviously those are three angles that work very well for that trainer. If you're getting a good price, that might be enough to make the pick on a contest play. And that's nice because the report is just there in black and white and you can just look at it. If you've got a little more time, if you're really into this stuff, the best tool would be uh, not at DRF Formulator the human being, but DRF Formulator <laughs> the tool to be able to go through trainer stats and look at how trainers have performed in certain situations, whether it's you know off the layoff adding blinkers or whatever it happens to be, and you can scroll through look at the winners that certain trainers have had with big prices. That's another way to do it, is mm -hmm. just look at all the horses a certain trainer has run. You, with Formulator, you can sort and you can look at just the long shots, and you can sort of let your brain do a little bit of work and say, hey, what are the, Todd Pletcher occasionally wins, hor wins with $20 horses. What do they have in common? And you might find uh, one of the ones that Mike dug up a little while back, graded stakes uh, with jockeys who aren't, um, Castellano or Velasquez, and the ROI goes through the roof. It's only a few mm -hmm. horses. It's not necessarily something that's going to go forward. But again, maybe on some big day, it's a reason to go ahead and reach for a horse who's going to end up running first or second at a price and delivering you the goods. So uh, <clears throat> the payouts are in for the second leg. Um, and we'll see George Shoot's second entry is indeed on the top. Uh, and um, we've had a couple others that had Tizel jump up into there. And um, so the leaderboard is now updated. You can see who uh, George Shute has in the third leg, which is number two, uh, Rose Griselia uh, at Gulfstream Park. If we want to look at the race details, you'll see uh, she is currently nine to two um, for trainer Peter Walder. Um, so obviously a, a decent price, but not your favorite. Uh, looks like a pretty wide open betting race. A couple big prices, but everybody else is um, right in the logical range. Tazell's win gives a great opportunity to talk about what I think is maybe the fundamental difference for a lot of players between the all-in format and the live format. Because, as I said before, the all-in format is really all about picking winners. I think a lot of players are a lot more comfortable going with lower priced horses. I was joking before about picking chalk, but really I think in the all-in format it can make a lot of sense because you never know how valuable those points will be. In the live format, you know the second half of the contest, even those folks way behind, they're going to have an opportunity to start playing the board and reaching for cap horses and just playing 10 to 1 and up. They, that's mm -hmm. not going to happen in the all-in format. You can much more grind your way along. And I think that's something that uh, Jonathan Kinchin mentioned to us when we were talking about this on the podcast, uh, th that he's much more, he's a, a, a chalky son of a gun anyway, and, th and then when you're not strategically disadvantaged in the second half of the contest, it's just all the more reason to go with the horse you think is going to win. Personally, I wouldn't take that idea too far. I think if you're torn between a horse that's going to be 2-1 to one and a horse that's going to be 5-1, to one, 
and you like them equally, I think of course you still take the five to one, but it's definitely an opportunity to lean towards the lower odds end of the spectrum. That's going to help a lot of people, especially maybe newer contest players making the adjustment from just handicapping and picking. You'll eventually, playing in live format contests, you're going to develop the sort of mental muscle memory to find out what eight to one shots look like, to find out what you know, some players even get used to finding out what cap horses look like and get a lot better at playing them. That'll develop in time. But for players starting out, I, I think it's a really good format, allowing them to just focus on picking winners. Paul Sherman has one of the best quotes, simplest and best quotes, about playing in contests. And he just says, you play what you like. And I think he would agree in the all-in format, you play what you like even more. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And let's say, okay, you're playing in this, this feeder tournament. Best case scenario, you win an entry to one of these live tournaments on the weekend. And we had a question from, from uh, someone in the audience. They actually sent this in via email prior to the show. They wanted to know, let's say they're sitting in first or second going into that last race. What do you suggest they do? Do they stick with the pick that they liked? Or do they start thinking and trying blocking, maybe reach for a bit of a price that might make them vulnerable if this horse wins? Maybe they want to block out the six to one shot. If this horse wins, someone would leapfrog them. How do you, what do you suggest somebody in that situation do? The default position is you play what you like. However, sometimes what you like, you already have anyway. Let's say you're in the lead by $8 and the the favorite or you know eight and change and the favorite that you like is even money there's no reason for you to play the horse in that case what you should do in that instance is do the math i have a whole section on contest math in the winning contest player figure out which horses you own sometimes it can be complicated depending on how much you're up by you obviously you do not want to play a horse that you already own because anybody behind you who plays that horse is going to be drawing dead anyway. In other words, you know, all in with no outs. They cannot get you. So that doesn't make any sense at all. It's maybe the one exception to play what you like. In that case, what you want to do is find the most sensible horse you can take. And I wouldn't let the odds at that point, if you can get beat, you know, you can get into game theory and you can say, well, this person is going to think I'm going to play this horse, so maybe I should play this other one instead because they'll be afraid to play horse A. That's a dangerous game. Some people are very good at the game theory, but it's a dangerous game. What I want to do is cover the horse, essentially, that I don't want to beat me. The horse that I like best, who can beat me? I don't want the horse that I like to win and to lose. That, for me, would be a gutting experience, and it's just maybe that's just my bias as a player. You can get as right. clever as you want, and there's a lot of personal ways you can take it. But that's my general advice, to cleave as close as you can to play who you like. I like that. Uh, all right, we've got a, a couple more minutes and a few more questions here. Uh, Nicholas uh, Bozovsky wants to know, can we safely assume scratches will be updated prior to the running of the first race in a contest on the new site? Uh, the quick answer, Pete, maybe you can expand if, if you know. Quick answer is, as soon as they go through the tote, they show up here. Yeah, that was my understanding. So as soon as the scratches are in, the scratches should be in. I, I'm a bit of a worry wart. I don't think it's a horrible thing if you want to double check it a couple of times and just make sure everything's working smoothly. But I, I believe when those scratches go in and they're entered into the tote, they're going to be right there in our system. All right, uh, a quick question from Bill Drew wants to know, are NHC qualifying credits or partial credits previously earned, uh, uh, I'm assuming on the other sites, transferable to this site? My best guess would be yes, to absolutely confirm that. That's a great one for either the old school NHC Qualify customer service or to reach out to that attorney help at drf.com. That would seem the only fair solution to me. Uh, I mm -hmm. don't know how the mechanics of it work. You probably have to call and, and hopefully get those uh, transferred over. Right, exactly. Um, and then a real quick question from Charlie Hughes wants to know if the PPs um, – uh, if you can print them in advance of the site, uh, of course, absolutely. You go back to the home, you can see PPs, uh, we click upcoming tournaments, you can see, view the PPs for any of these races. Let's say we want to do the Santa Anita feeder uh, on the 28th, click view PPs, you get the PPs for that day's races, you print them out, and you're good to go. 
yeah, it should be a, a good thing to get started in advance. I, you know, I can't emphasize enough how much I'd love to see more people getting involved and playing around with some of the DRF Plus and DRF Formulator tools for contests eventually. But, you yeah. know, hey, there's nothing wrong with the old school, uh, old school pen and paper also. You can find plenty of winners there. In fact, they're all listed. <laughs> of course they Full are. Harvey Pack line. I'm sorry, Harvey. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we're pretty much at the top of the hour. It's been a fun hour. Uh, so thank you, Pete. Uh, I had a pleasure. I learned a lot. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. You asked some great questions and did a great job uh, moderating with the listeners. Just because this webinar is over doesn't mean the conversation has to end. For general questions about handicapping, for specific questions about the tournaments platform, Find me at Looms Boldly on Twitter. Mike is at DRF Formulator. We've got this podcast we do twice a week. We're planning on spending a whole lot of time talking tournaments, talking betting strategy, and talking handicapping. So anything you want to know, um, hit us up. We've really enjoyed letting the listeners program some of our shows, including the one that went up today. You guys tend to ask great questions, and it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Uh, is that it, Mike? we have anything else, or are we all sorted I out? I think I think that's it. Take us home, Pete. Sounds good. All right. So for Mike Hogan, I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. Thanks for attending the DRF webinar introduction to the new tournament platform and on tournament strategy. You've been watching content produced by DRF.com.